For those paying attention to the development of global capitalism, it has always been readily apparent that this development occurs as unevenly as it does on the national and local scales. That some countries have been persistently underdeveloped through various mechanisms is no surprise even to proponents of market economies. What separates Marxists and other radical traditions from the neoliberal position is the assertion that this uneven development is a feature of capitalism rather than a bug. For Marxists in particular, the notion of unequal exchange explains one such feature of the system. The product of one unit of socially average labor in one place trades for more than the product of one unit of socially average labor in another place. This claim has been scrutinized over the decades. Various theoretical objections have been made, and the lack of substantive empirical work has weakened the argument. However, in recent years, thanks to the availability of international trade data and the diligent work of certain scholars, measures of unequal exchange have become more feasible and compelling. Today we will consider the results of one of these efforts, made by the Italian economist Andrea Ricci. Before getting to the empirics, we will need to eat some theoretical vegetables. There is no shame in skipping to the end for the punchline, but you may find that the theoretical conversation will help with understanding the results. Comparing labor across borders presents a number of difficulties. How do we account for different intensities, productivities, and monetary expressions of a unit of labor? If we were to consider, say, a global average labor hour, we would find that for a commodity traded at a common international price, some more productive countries would have a national average labor hour that fetches more units of international money than the less productive countries. Suppose there are two countries in the world, A and B. It takes country A, on average, half an hour to produce one unit of commodity X. Meanwhile, country B spends, on average, one and a half hours to produce one unit of commodity X. Assuming, as most conventional theories like to, free trade and perfect competition, the so-called law of one price holds. The law simply suggests that in the absence of market imperfections, identical commodities fetch an equal price. In our simple example, this means the commodity X has a common international price. Both country A and country B must sell their produced commodities at this global price. Suppose this price is $2 per unit of commodity X. This suggests that country A's international monetary expression of labor time, MELT, is higher than that of country B's. One hour of country A's labor is worth $4, while one hour of country B's labor is worth $1.34. But differently, one hour of country A's labor trades for about three hours of country B's labor. Such differences can persist either between countries on the international level, or even between industries internationally. In other words, there may also exist discrepancies between, say, manufacturing as a sector and raw material extraction as a sector. We have shown on this channel before how the more productive parties, for instance countries, firms, industries, and so on, benefit from unequal exchange. Conventional theories obscure what is occurring in these exchanges by supposing that prices reflect values exactly. Thus, if both country A and B are selling commodity X at the same price, they must be producing the same value. Turning to Marx's value theory, we see that prices and values need only coincide at the aggregate level. For each individual actor, however, prices and values do not match up. Andrea Ricci, in his Value and Unequal Exchange in International Trade, argues that the best interpretation of the concept of value in Marx is that value is a social algorithm. Insofar as an algorithm is an abstract logical procedure consisting of an ordinate and finite sequence of successive steps needed to solve a problem, value is a social algorithm, an objective social procedure, a real abstraction that allows us to determine the equivalence relation transforming qualitatively different commodities into quantitatively identical exchange values. This algorithm is social because it occurs and is repeated on a structural scale that extends beyond the individual. The social algorithm of value establishes qualities of reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity in commodity exchange. Reflexivity simply refers to the rather obvious fact that each commodity can be traded with itself. For instance, one unit of X trades for one unit of X. 
Symmetry refers to the basic relation established when two qualitatively different commodities are exchanged with each other. One unit of x trades for two units of y. Implicit in this relation is that the magnitude of value on both sides of the trade is identical. Hence, two units of y trade for one unit of x. The relation is symmetric. Last, transitivity suggests that if one unit of x trades for two units of y, and one unit of y trades for two units of z, then one unit of x must trade for four units of z. Extrapolated to the aggregate social level, the algorithm of value connects total labor with total value produced by society, and with the total price of all that has been produced. When summed up on the social level, be it national or global, these components are definitionally equivalent. At the individual level, there is no such guarantee. The same quantity of labor time may well produce more or less value, and the product of the same quantity of labor time will almost certainly have diverging monetary expressions in the form of prices. When the individual monetary expressions of labor time are the same as the average social melt, the exchange is equivalent. All cases where the individual melts do not coincide characterize unequal exchange, and consequently value transfer. For more on value transfer, feel free to review the video on unequal exchange. After a thorough theoretical discussion and mathematical derivation, Ritchie devises a formula for net national value transfers. This measure of value transfers factors in many diverse theories of unequal exchange by including expressions for intra- and inter-industry trade. Let us break down the terms together. For value transfers between industries, the first term captures a difference in wages. For instance, does manufacturing have a higher or lower wage than the global average? The second term captures the difference in profit rates across industries. Does the raw material sector have a higher rate of profit than the communication services sector? The final term captures the difference in capital compositions between sectors. Some sectors may be more capital intensive than others, and hence more productive. For value transfers within industries but between countries, the first term captures the international difference in wages for a given industry. For instance, are manufacturing workers in China paid more than their counterparts in Kazakhstan? The second term captures the international difference in profit rates. For example, is hydrocarbon extraction more profitable in Norway or in Nigeria? Ritchie then combines both the transfers between industries and between countries into a single expression that calculates value transfers for each country's industries. This is the base model that Ritchie develops, though he later goes on to consider the effects of trade in global value chains. Given the importance of outsourcing and offshoring in the neoliberal era, not accounting for the distribution of production processes across globally linked nodes would result in an incomplete picture. We will not go over this modified derivation in detail either. For those who are interested in the math, Ritchie's book provides ample discussion of the models. Ritchie's model, in effect, measures unequal exchange through two main channels. The traditional unequal exchange of final goods that are imported and exported and the unequal exchange of trade in intermediate goods that pass through global chains of production and circulation. Looking at the data from 1990 to 2019, Ritchie finds that world value transfers in total trade rose from $704 billion, or 3.1% of world GDP, to nearly $4 trillion in 2019, or 4.5% 4 of world GDP. Meanwhile, in the same window of time, the total development assistance received by developing countries was a mere $165 billion. In plain terms, the global north got 23 times more in value transfers than it gave back in the form of development assistance. Unsurprisingly, the regions that were net recipients of value included the European Monetary Union, North America, and Western Europe. By the 2010s, net inflows of value were contributing some 8% of the GDP in the core economies, much higher than the average GDP growth in the core. The rest of the world naturally experienced a net outflow of value, with the poor periphery losing as much as 20% of GDP in value transfers. The biggest donors of value were countries of Southeast and South Asia, who in recent times have taken on the role of factories of the world. Staggeringly, the average citizen of the core countries experienced a net value inflow worth $3,810 in 2019. 
For a citizen of Europe, this sum was, on average, $6,920. Meanwhile, a citizen of the emerging periphery might have expected to lose some $634 in value transfers. Of course, these per capita figures are illustrative, and certainly do not account for the fact that much of the remuneration from net value transfers likely falls into the hands of capital rather than labor. As a final exercise, Ritchie also calculated an unequal exchange dependency index. The idea behind the UED index was to reflect the withdrawal or accrual of resources for capital accumulation due to unequal exchange. By Ritchie's estimates, Russia, Southeast Asia, and North Africa lost more than half of their potential economic surplus in 2018 through value transfers. In other words, these regions lost more than half of what could have been invested into development. Meanwhile, Western Europe gained nearly enough in value transfers to cover the full cost of capital accumulation. The power of Marx's theory of unequal exchange lies in the fact that it is a staple feature of capitalism. Unequal exchange is a fact derived from the social algorithm of value. In our theoretical considerations, we assumed free trade and perfect competition, which we know in reality to be unlikely. Still, the acknowledgement that unequal exchange persists, even when capitalism functions as intended, is critical in understanding the asymmetric dynamics of the geopolitical economy. At the same time, as is clear from the results, unequal exchange is not the whole picture. It certainly does not explain all global development issues, nor does it explain the immense wealth of the developed world. It also does not preclude participation in international trade for countries looking to build economic power, a point Marx himself warned against. Ritchie's findings inspire future possibilities. With the advent of extremely detailed international data, it will be possible to extend Marx's initial insights in ways that were not feasible even a few decades ago. These extensions will certainly have great scientific value, but perhaps more importantly, they will supplement a renewed anti-imperialist political discourse that is able to mount a contemporary critique of capitalism with great precision.